Well, let's discuss the 20th century. Um, obviously, astronomical knowledge exploded, particularly after the, the uh, Hubble's knowledge that the uh, discovery that the universe is expanding and that there are galaxies beyond our own galaxy. Well, the, the thing that really set the stage for the 20th century was Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, believed that he had actually seen evidence on Mars of canals, <laughs> artificially constructed canals, which he interpreted as evidence of a dying civilization which was trying to bring water to the oases uh, in a last, last desperate struggle for survival. Um, believe it or not, that controversy dragged on for several decades. Uh, some scientists uh, were aligned with, uh, with Lowell on that and others uh, didn't believe the evidence. Uh, and that really uh, did set the stage for the rest of the 20th century. Although by about 1916, there was some consensus developing that, uh, that those canals were not artificial. Uh, but even when uh, you come to the space age, uh, there were, you know, one of the things that they wanted to see when the first spacecraft went past Mars, the Mariner spacecraft, uh, was whether there were canals on Mars or any evidence of the canals. What were the canals, even if they weren't artificial, what were they? It turns out there's very little overlap between uh, the actual surface features on Mars and what uh, Lowell uh, thought were, were canals. But ever since that time, Mars has held a special place in the, in the human imagination, I think especially in the American imagination, uh, and uh, certainly has been a centerpiece for uh, science fiction, Ray Bradbury, uh, all these novels that have been written about, uh, about Mars, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs earlier in the century. Um, and uh, what I found is that scientists, people who do real science, have been affected by that uh, science fiction, but of course they're looking for evidence, uh, for proof uh, of, uh, of things related to extraterrestrial life. Then in the 1950s and 60s, we had this odd phenomenon, which I must admit captivated me, about the possibility of unidentified flying objects. We really were visited. Well, one of the most remarkable things about the 20th century debate uh, on extraterrestrial life is that people actually believed they had evidence that the extraterrestrials were here. <laughs> uh, and what this all comes down to really is a question of evidence, as in so much of the rest of the extraterrestrial life debate. What is the evidence of UFOs? Uh, I myself think that the evidence is not good for, for, uh, uh, for determining that these are of extraterrestrial origin. Uh, but there were, there were studies done uh, by the U.S. Air Force. The Air Force got involved. There was a famous report done in the 1960s which concluded that there was uh, nothing to this at all. Now, I think that study was somewhat biased, called the Condon Report. Uh, but um, but the, um, the, uh, the bottom line is that uh, in the end, I think there really is not the evidence that the U UFOs uh, uh, have uh, visited the Earth. But it was fun for a while. It was fun for a while, and there are still people who uh, seriously uh, believe it and argue it, but... Uh, Many think they've been abducted. <laughs> well, that's right, uh, and I think that we would need to keep an open mind, even on abduction, but let me see the evidence. <laughs> okay, now, what happened in the serious part of the debate from that period onward to the present time in terms of the... Because today, extraterrestrial life is a very serious part of our scientific worldview. It certainly is. Uh, uh, the extraterrestrial life debate is a serious part of our, our worldview. It really began, uh, really a, a major push was given by the space age because with the space age you could actually go out to Mars and other planets and see uh, whether there was life there based on photography or actually landing on Mars, which we did in 1976. Uh, so you, you certainly had uh, one component of the extraterrestrial life debate being uh, the searching for life in the solar system. Uh, the, the Viking spacecraft did land on Mars. They found, uh, not only did they, they did not find canals or intelligence, they didn't find uh, microorganisms either, and they didn't find organic molecules down to parts per billion. If you don't have organic molecules, you can't have life. So there, there probably is no life on Mars. Uh, and, and then the next step, of course, was the look for fossil life on Mars, and there was a big, um, a big flap over that in uh, 1996 when uh, uh, meteorites which came from Mars are, were believed to have uh, evidence for fossil life. Uh, that, the consensus on that now is that that's not true. So uh, there are still some very interesting things about the solar system in terms of organic molecules, uh, possible life on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. 
But really, attention now has moved beyond the solar system to other planetary systems, uh, and this has been one of the major developments over the last decade. A decade ago, right now, uh, there was only one planet known to exist outside of the solar system. We now know almost 200 planets that exist outside the solar system. They're all gas giants, but it's believed that the smaller ones are there, and they will be detected by instruments such as Kep uh, the, the NASA Kepler spacecraft. So um, uh, when you have more planets, you have more places where life could develop, and that's going to be one of the major thrusts of the 21st century. It would seem that one of the primary discoveries that planets are not rare really impels the likelihood of extraterrestrial life as, as in a substantive scientific way as nothing else before. Yes, I mean, the, if no planets were found to exist out there, that would really be a showstopper. <laughs> If there's no life in the solar system, there are no other planets out there, then end of the debate, really. <laughs> Unless you believe, uh, as Fred Hoyle did in, in a scenario like the black cloud where you have electromagnetic life or something like that. But uh, uh, as I say, the, uh, in the 21st century, the, the extraterrestrial life debate really will move beyond the solar system. Uh, another component has been uh, research on the origins of life. Uh, because uh, even if you have planets, how likely is it that life will develop on a, on a planet? Uh, and the origins of life research has made some um, uh, progress during the course of the 20th century, uh, notably in finding uh, that life occurs in extreme environments, uh, deep under the oceans, the hydrothermal vents and the tube worms. And uh, so the implication is that if life can survive in harsh environments like that, maybe even if you have planets with harsh environments that life can develop there. So origins of life is another field that's feeding into this whole debate. And then you have SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which began with Frank Drake in, in 1960 and uh, is being continued uh, even to this day with much more sophisticated equipment than, uh, than Drake ever had, uh, with using radio telescopes, also some optical searches. Uh, but the bottom line there is that although there have been some interesting signals, uh, nothing definitive yet. Uh, and in fact, it's called the Great Silence. Why is there the Great Silence if there are so many extraterrestrials out there, as people like uh, Drake and Sagan and many others think, where are they? And in <laughs> fact, this is part of what's called the Fermi Paradox. If there's so many out there, given the time scales of the universe, uh, the universe is 13.7 billion years old, uh, wouldn't they have had time to be here on Earth? And this brings you back to the UFO debate. <laughs> Those people say, yes, they're here, but the evidence isn't there. So, so that's a great paradox. So as you look at the whole story, the human quest over history for extraterrestrial life, the current serious science on it, as a historian, what is your overview? I think the extraterrestrial life debate is one of the great questions uh, that remains to be answered. And I think that it, uh, it really is a kind of a worldview. Uh, you can call, it's what I call the biological universe, the idea that life is common. Um, and you have to look at it, I think, in the sense of cosmic evolution. Cosmic evolution is the master narrative, the, the mother of all master narratives, the story of the universe from the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago up to the present. And the question is, how does cosmic evolution end? Does it end with the physical universe, only planets, stars, and galaxies? Or does it end commonly with the biological universe, which is life, mind, and intelligence? That, the answer to that question, is uh, really going to determine the human future in the long run. If it's just a physical universe, uh, we're the only ones, or, or, or we are extremely rare, then our destiny is going to be to go out into the universe, travel out into the universe with space, uh, space uh, ships, and, uh, and do whatever we want, take over or whatever. Uh, but if there are extraterrestrials out there, then we are going to have to interact with them. I think a much more interesting scenario uh, because uh, they are likely to be uh, much older than us, given the time scales uh, of the universe. So it's not just another theory or hypothesis, it's a kind of a worldview which will, as I say, determine the destiny of humanity.